All right, let's get underway. Uh, well, thank you everybody for taking the time to attend uh, the latest Prime Movers Lab webinar. Um, I wanna thank you to our panelists uh, and to all of you for taking the time out of your very, very busy schedules uh, to join us. My name is Justin Briggs. Uh, I support human augmentation practice and I'm an investment partner and biologist at Prime Movers Lab. We are a uh, venture capital firm that invests in breakthrough scientific founders that have the opportunity and the chance to impact billions of lives. And in the process, develop some really amazing technology that has huge, huge impacts for, in our case, many, many patients around the world. What we're gonna do today is we're gonna dive into a specific area and we're gonna look through uh, a very unique lens. At Prime Movers Lab, we have six different large overreaching practice areas, transportation, energy, infrastructure, manufacturing, agriculture, and human augmentation which we consider all of healthcare, from diagnostics, therapeutics, and devices. On today's uh, webinar, we're gonna take a look at, specifically at the start, the diagnostics layer. But we're gonna do something very, very unique. We're gonna take three different companies that essentially look at the very same thing from three different perspectives. And that is ourselves. So we talk a lot about uh, transcendence, here at, at Prime Movers. And so what we need to understand is that it's not just about the patient and their samples. It's not just about one test, one analyte, one metabolite, one assay, one answer that you're trying to get. You need more information in the place that you need to start. Fundamentally, it's about human cells, either one or a collective and their behavior, their phenotype, their genotype, and what they're actually doing within your body to either protect you from disease or to, if they're working aberrantly, to cause disease. So that's going to come from their physical characteristics, their surface markers. We'll use words like phenotype, their genotype, their genomic, transcriptomic profiles, and even their behavior. We need more resolution. We need higher throughput. And we need more massively parallel tests to be able to uncover what we need to solve disease. And so no one company could provide that perspective. So we chose three different perspectives. And so we couldn't only tell that with diagnostic companies as well. The one you'll see is actually uh, dives just outside of that as well. We take three different companies. One, Sampling Human has invented a unique way to do single cell analysis within an individual sample without any expensive equipment. They enabled this feat using what they call living diagnostics, engineered cells called dots that can be customized to target and design new, new diagnostics to just about anything. Uh, or Aliva looks at many cells together. Then they paint or stain the cells to better understand them for diagnostic purposes. They've simplified the time and resource intensive process of cellular pathology and histology, miniaturized it using microfluidics, automated the cell visualization, and digitize the readout. So they can sit in any clinic, even a dentist's office, and detect cancers before liquid biopsies, automate, uh, um, they can grade dysplastic cells, and they can use a swab, a brush, a biopsy, or if necessary, a punch or needle biopsy. And then Zafrin's is able to analyze single cells in a collective, but one at a time at the million scale on a tiny sheet glass slide. Their platform allows the capability to analyze hundreds of thousands of cells, observe their single cell responses and behavior, and then perturb and observe biology at unprecedented scales. It gives us this ability to transcend that data gap and identify novel disease biomarkers and discover novel drugs less expensively so we can actually go out and do the experiments that we wanna do. But I couldn't have identified these disparate companies without somebody extremely brilliant and knowledgeable in the area. So we conducted a global search for someone who could support me in analyzing almost 800 companies in human augmentation, whittle that down to a handful of companies that we could talk to, um, over a hundred, whittle that down to dozens that we would do a second call with, and just a handful that we would actually get to and bring into something like a webinar, and certainly only one or two that we might actually even invest in uh, at some point. So with that, I'd like to introduce uh, someone who's become very close to me over the past few months, um, uh, soon to be Dr. Ted Ling Hugh, who is our uh, research fellow in human augmentation. Uh, with that, I'm gonna hand it to Ted and he's gonna start off our webinar. 
Thanks, Justin. And uh, again, welcome to all the audience and thank you to the panelists for joining. Uh, my name is Ted. I'm one of, I'm a PhD candidate um, studying biomedical informatics at Northwestern, but I am also the research fellow for um, Primary Rivers Lab in the sector of human augmentation. And I'll be kind of taking lead um, with Justin's help, of course, of, of um, leading this panel. So um, first and foremost, I think I'd like to just um, introduce the panelists and, and kind of let the panelists um, tell us a little bit more about their background, their experience, as well as their company. Um, Justin gave um, a really a great one line kind of overview of each of these companies, but kind of would love um, the panelists uh, to tell us a little bit more about themselves and kind of their experience. So um, Swami, why don't we start with you? Thank you, Ted. Thanks, Justin. Thanks for the opportunity to chat with everybody here. Um, so I'm the CEO of a company called Zafrins. Um, I have a PhD in physics. I don't have a traditional biology background. Um, this is my third company. The first company I started was called Omnio. Uh, the again, I come from a theoretical physics background. I've been influenced, inspired by the general themes of unification, generalization, and and simple concepts that can be kind of together uh, reveal greater insights. Um, the first company was an attempt to democratize diagnostics through sequencing. So we built a really tiny box that could you just stick in a swab. It extracts the DNA, amplifies it, and does the sequencing. It ended up being pre pretty much the most accurate sequencer sequencing technology in the world. So it's now advancing uh, as part of specific biosciences for the sequencing accuracy. Um, I'd always thought that the diagnostics was the be all and end all of healthcare. If you diagnose something, there was always a drug, but then realized through building Omnium that there was not always a drug. And the second company decided to jump into therapeutics and make drugs. Um, so again, the idea was to democratize the process of drug discovery. So we came up with methods to synthesize really large number of compounds and do cell-based assays with them. And again, we were quite successful. We have a couple of molecules that will uh, likely get to the clinic this year, next year. Um, and again, building Plexium with the second company, I realized the, the disparity in responses, there's such diversity in responses to drugs and therapeutics that at Zafrin's, what we're trying to understand is what is the cause of diversity and disparity in cell responses? Could we understand millions of cells at a time? Could we understand patient-specific cells and start profiling the full um, the, the full molecular responses, the full functional uh, capabilities of cells at the single cell level. So we do this, like Justin mentioned, not just by looking at cells, but also perturbing them and observing uh, the functional molecular responses uh, to a large number of perturbations. I'll look forward to sharing more information over time. Great, thanks so much, Swami. Um, John, why don't you go next? Thank you, Ted. Uh, uh, thanks to PML, Justin, Ted, for having us here today. So uh, my name is John T. McDevitt, and up front, I'd like to provide a little bit of background I think is relevant to today's topic. Uh, in this area, I wear three hats that are important. Uh, the first as a bioengineering professor, and my research team makes medical micro devices. Uh, we started with an electronic taste chip, and this uh, effort was recognized with a Scientific Discovery of the Year Award. We then moved into clinical themes and then this became a medical device. Uh, the second area uh, that, that's key for what I'll talk about today is um, my participation as the director of the Gulf Coast Consortium on Early Disease Detection. Uh, when I was in Texas, in the Texas Medical Center I interacted with over 100 clinicians, exploring their important diseases. And in six of these projects, they became major clinical studies. And in each case, our medical micro device was used as a core to acquire new data. Uh, we raised over 40 million in grant funding and, and collected uh, large databases of cells, uh, which takes me to my third hat and that is serving as a scientific founder and chief scientist for Oraliva, which I'll tell you more about today. Uh, but Oraliva has uh, the first point of care cytomics on a chip technology. And what, what I mean here by cytomics is the study of cell biology, i.e. cytology at the single cell level, but combining bioinformatics knowledge with molecular-based imaging techniques. So we have dubbed our core technology as C-Aid, 
which stands for Cytology Artificial Intelligence Identification. And stated succinctly, uh, C8 helps us to see cancer better. Great, thanks so much, John. And uh, Daniel. Oh, Daniel, I, think I got it. Uh, Dad, Justin, yeah, thanks, thanks so much for the invite. This is a really exciting uh, uh, panel, and I'm really happy to be part of this uh, uh, part of this webinar. Uh, so, yeah, a little bit about me. You know, throughout throughout my career, I've sort of geeked out over different things at different times. So I. I started off geeking out over complex systems. I still do uh, today. Uh, for the long part though, I, I geeked out about cells uh, through the lens of synthetic biology. Uh, I started the first regional group in synthetic biology and we put together a great research team. Uh, and for a greater part of the last decade, uh, continued to geeking out over cells, but now more in the, in the human health context uh, as a, one of the co-founders of a company called Sampling Human, which I'm the CEO. Uh, so about sampling human, what we do really is pretty simple. You know, we just make single cells uh, a whole, whole lot easier to, to measure. Uh, and really what sets us apart is that uh, for the first time, we're able to, with our technology, resolve cells directly in solution. So we developed an intelligent bead technology. It's sort of like a, uh, basically like a transistor that works uh, in, in liquid this technology is able to identify and integrate different uh, uh, different cell features, uh, identify cells in complex samples like blood, uh, bone marrow, uh, and then report on those cells, the, on the molecular content uh, of those cells. What's important is that it's it's not an in instrument. Right? It's a it's a targeted technology that you simply mix into the uh, mix into the sample and then you make the measurement using a simple device like a, like a plate reader, a technology that basically is used routinely to do common essays uh, like, like an ELISA. So basically we take the complex operation of an instrument and we replace it by pretty much a shake, an incubation and a scan uh, uh, of, a, of a test tube. And uh, and by this, you know, we're, what, what's what's important is that we're really able to uh, scale single cell data, so that we can go from measuring a few samples of a thousand cells to thousands of samples and millions of cells, right? And that's and that's really where the power lies, because we can then unlock some really important practical applications, not only in diagnostics and disease monitoring, but also in quality control and manufacturing. Uh, in drug discovery uh, as well. And for us, it's an exciting time in the company. So we started testing our products last year. Uh, and it, it was exciting because we started testing them with flow cytometry users. Uh, and, and, you know, for us, we were, we were really pleasantly surprised at how this ease and this, this transformation of the single cell analysis uh, uh, workflow really sort of sunk in, sunk in with them. And then of course, once they realized that they're also getting superior performance, uh, we are now getting sort of uh, 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 demands for different types of applications, different types of essays, and that's really where we are as a com company. We're a platform company that makes our technology available for others to make some really uh, exciting products, right? We want to change the narrative. The question, the question shouldn't be, should we make single cell measurements, right? The, the question should be, why should we continue to make mixed cell bulk measurements, right? And that's really that's really where our motto is. Great, thank you, thank you to all the panelists for that introduction. And um, to kind of kick off the panel, I'd like to just start really broad and just ask why diagnostics? Why why this space and specifically more why is this time in history the right time to invent diagnostics or to invest in diagnostics? Um, what are some of the Kind of the historical things that have led to this point that makes it so attractive to be kind of in the diagnostic space and um daniel if it's okay i'd like to just stay with you and, and then pass it off uh, to the other panelists after that yeah, absolutely you know, i i do agree with that statement it is an exciting time for for diagnostics you know right now when you probably go for a regular checkup you will get measurements like alt ast 
you know, TSA, CRP that basically tell you how well your organs are functioning. Uh, you may also get sequencing and you may get information about, uh, you know, your uh, BRCA1, 2 uh, 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 gene variants. Uh, you, so you could get genomic data as well. Uh, really, we're now at the point where we can change, we can shift the resolution uh, one uh, all the way down to the fundamental building blocks of life cells. You know, for over 200 years, we've uh, we've so the, the field of cell biology is over 200 years uh, 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 old. Uh, it's been recognized that human disease is cellular disease, and we've had various types of methods that have enabled us to 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 study that and to uh, and to to break down, you know, where that disease come comes from. In, in terms of diagnostics, you know, I think the last time we saw this type of a, this type of a, a timing, this type of a phase was really with the beginning of molecular diagnostics in the 1990s, where we were, where we for the first time started collecting uh, genomic data uh, through through technologies like PCR. Uh, with single cells, you know, that we're seeing now that same opportunity, uh, where multiple fields are converging. So technologically, we're building up the knowledge base. So we're able to collect really high dimensional single cell data that can precisely identify a particular cell type. That's important. But we also have the computational tools now. So with machine learning, the computational tools to be able to recognize patterns in that data. And I've seen some really exciting technologies on, in, in, that, space, uh, in that space as well. Uh, what, what now, you know, and then, of course, we have technologies that have been evolving now for and that are quite mature in sequencing technologies that can make the downstream analysis of this of this data uh, uh, more, you know, the downstream workflows more more streamlined. Uh, you know, we, we see ourselves as being a sort of a perfect fit in that in that puzzle. And then also, you know, changing changing the value really of this of this not really a new diagnostic, rather, it's a new era of uh, diagnostic resolution that's that that we'll, that we'll be seeing um yeah and i and i think uh swami i'd like to go to you next just you know kind of on that concept of this convergence of you know the multiple fields coming into the single cell analysis and then specifically more into diagnostics i know your company does a lot of that um what do you what do you think why diagnostics now and, and especially kind of with the convergence of all these fields like what do you see is um has been um, the progression of technology up to this point that makes single cell uh, analysis in kind of the realm of diagnostics so unique? Yeah, and I think it, to me, it boils down to the emergence of new therapeutic modalities. There's a lot more therapeutic opportunities today than even 10 years ago. You know, we've got gene therapies, we've got cell therapies, completely independent modalities coming through. So back in the day, even 15 years ago, you'd sequence somebody and you'd get all these variants of unknown significance. You wouldn't know what to do with them. Uh, right now, you just you know, CRISPR knock in the, the mutation, see what happens to the cell. So we actually have a methodology to understand what we diagnose. Um, so the value of diagnostics goes significantly higher because now we can treat patients based on what you find, which didn't exist again even 10, 15 years ago. So the emergence of um, understanding and manipulation of cells that can even be therapeutic opportunities is truly, in my mind, what enables uh, diagnostic to have a more central, more important role today. Um, single cells, again, um, because we can perturb cells, because we can observe what the perturbations means functionally uh, at the single cell level across different tissue, in, in a heart tissue, in a lung tissue, in a, in a blood sample, and understand what the differential effects could be, um, that completely unlocks um, how this can be transferred to a therapeutic benefit. Yeah. Um, and John, kind of on, on that note as well, I know you had mentioned that um, you know, your technology incorporates a lot of the bioinformatics um, technology. And I'd like to kind of touch on that a little bit of, you know, this idea of convergence of fields, but now we see this um, integration of computational and, and kind of bioinformatics uh, analysis downstream. Maybe talk a little bit about, um, you know, the advancements of bioinformatics pipelines, um, computational power, and kind of how that feeds into our advancement of diagnostics. Sure, sure, Ted. Uh well, let me just start up front by saying uh, I think omics technologies are coming of age now, and uh, I'm incredibly excited about uh, liquid biopsy and next generation sequencing. But but uh, appropriate for day today is the discussion of, of uh, cell based uh, uh, testing and cytomics. I think is 
part of this diagnostic revolution where the cell based modalities are providing us with more information in many cases than the other omics based uh, uh, approaches. Uh, so th there are a, a variety of, of timely developments of technology and image analysis and data analysis that are now possible that allows us to combine and, and integrate to more advanced function in our um, clinical testing. And an important part in, in this area is the maturation of medical micro device or lab on a chip or uh, micro total analysis systems that are just now uh, reaching a point of maturity and creating some new information for in vitro diagnostics. So the, the key here uh, in, in this particular area is the ability to democratize testing. So when you create a, a function, an extreme function on, on a lab, you're able to drive away from the hospital and push down to the clinic and even into the home more advanced care. So, so we feel that that's a really, really key trend that, that's pushing in this area. Also, the linkage of artificial intelligence, machine learning, uh, is making significant inroads in uh, pathology communities. And uh, this is uh, key to remove the subjectivity, which is so dominant in this particular area, especially in cancer diagnosis, where, where it becomes a, an extreme challenge as you move to more rural settings and outside of the elite medical centers. And also we, we, we see a huge gap now uh, in shortage of doctors and, and nurses, and that places a stronger load on, on the technology to uh, put us in a position where non-experts are forced to act as experts with technology uh, filling the gap. And so th this, this, uh, this particular gap and why this convergence is so powerful here, it, it makes me a, a lot feel uh, about what Steve Jobs had uh, in making the smartphone and the iPhone, uh, pulling together some key areas, but putting it in a package that, that is significant. And, and in this area, uh, this convergence of what I'll describe as smart diagnostics involves four areas, uh, a microfluidic engine that allows the test to be completed anywhere, uh, the integration of multi-parameter and multi-modal test. And in our case for oral cancer, for our initial product, we are combining 200 measurements completed at the single cell level uh, this brings us to the third area of cloud-based diagnostic models, which are backed by large clinical studies. Uh, that gives us uh, advanced diagnostic models better than the standard of care. And then finally, uh, and this is the key to bring everything together in an intuitive package. Uh, not everyone is a life science expert or have a PhD in this particular area, but intuitive reporting uh, with numerical index indices is, is uh, a key to where, where uh, we feel the next steps in smart diagnostics is going. Can I pull this thread just a little bit? John, you mentioned, Daniel, you mentioned, Swami, you mentioned all in different, slightly different contexts, the concept of democratization. Could you kind of each go through and specifically mention um, in whatever context it's relevant to your technology, how specifically your technology democratizes? Daniel, could we start with you? Yeah, definitely. So, you know, we're, uh, I, the, the democratization really comes by building on existing infrastructure. So, you know, our, our approach is that the diagnostics can't really be less accessible than they already are, right? Uh, I mean, we're, we can we can already argue how accessible today's diagnostics are, and so if the if the technology is becoming even less accessible, more expensive, then you know what is that is that really sustainable? And is that is there a market there to support those technologies? And so, you know, our approach really is to make a um, basically it's it's kind of like the Tesla model is where we look at our 
our uh, products as sort of the software equivalent that upgrades existing infrastructure uh, uh, without really uh, without really hampering you know that uh, uh, the, the the cost of of the overall process. And so really, it's coming back to that motto: make single cell analysis as easy to do as mixed cell analysis. I, I can jump in. I mean, uh, from our perspective, um, if you, if, if, I mean, I, I, I guess there shouldn't be debate that high resolution, high throughput experimentation and data is valuable. Uh, today, to do high resolution, high throughput experimentation requires an army of robots doing lots and lots of 96 well fit experiments. Um, not very many people can afford or can even conceive of doing things at that scale. So we want to kind of replace the whole thing. So if you have a microscope, you just pipe it in, you're ready to go do millions, tens of millions of experiments, um, not just down to the single cell level, in addition, perturbing the cells and observing their response at the single cell level across millions of cells. And all you need is a pipette and a microscope. Um, so because I mean, if you can imagine doing such high throughput, high resolution experiments so trivially, what we want to unlock is the type of imagination, type of experiments one can think of. Um, so nobody wants to do transcription factor drugging. Nobody wants to think about you know, drugging non-enzymatic proteins. But if you can enable people to do such an experiment for, I don't know, $5,000, what new questions can we ask? What new insights can we gain? And that we think is true democratization uh, of knowledge of, of our understanding of biology. And John, did you want to add anything? Yes, uh, Justin, let me... Um, yeah, my little piece uh, here. So, so uh, we found uh, actually something fascinating. Uh, let me tell you a little story about uh, our grand opportunity study, um, an international uh, clinical study funded by the NIH, which paired us with a number of different institutions, 999 patients, uh, uh, a very special program by the NIH uh, that allowed us to create the largest uh, potentially malignant oral database in the world. Uh, and in doing this study, we also paired with some of the best oral medicine and best oral pathologists in the world. Uh, as we went into this uh, perspective study, we began to compare the outcomes of, of a panel of pathologists and to our amazing <laughs> surprise, uh, there was 70% uh, level of disagreement for our most important diagnostic category. We looked at six, but mild dysplasia is really what you need to find in oral cancer patients in order to prevent this from being a death sentence, basically. It's now caught stage three, stage four cancer. So we're now sitting here with a unbelievable problem with the elite medical centers with pathologists who do not agree on the most important di diagnosis. And that uh, gave us the OS event uh, where, where we, we had to innovate. In this case, we developed a four stage um, pathology uh, process, which took us to the truth. But at that truth now, which backs our artificial in intelligence uh, diagnostic models, we are now, uh, taking that information, acknowledging the gap that exists in pathology and making non-expert clinicians, uh, largely the dentists, there are 120,000 dentists in the United, GP dentists in the United States. And most of them, if not all of them have trouble looking at an oral lesion. Uh, there's 25 million of these floating around in the, in the country right, right now. And, and you don't know what to do with, with them. So our step to democratization is to deliver a point of care instrument that can take a omics based test, complete it at the point of need and deliver expert information uh, that em empowers the non-expert to, to save the lives of their patients. Uh, yeah, I, I think um, this concept of, of democratizing diagnostics is so important, but I, I just want to dial it back just a little bit because I think all three of you have kind of touched on these like newer technologies that um, allow us to see different aspects of the single cell um, 
whether that's the genome or the transcriptome or the metabolome. Um, I, I just wanted to ask a little bit about what are some current trends um, in the single cell space, whether that's, you know, um, the omic, like the multi-omics or the spatial transcriptomics um, space that you guys see that um, you feel like is kind of like the next wave of big single cell analysis that can push the frontier of, of diagnostics into that kind of that next level. Um, so Daniel, why don't we start with you? Yeah, so I do want to, you know, get uh, sort of put that a little bit into context that, uh, uh, you know, single cell analysis dates back to mid last century. And then in 2013, we started to really look at uh, 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 transcriptomic data. Uh, and that's where sort of drop seek and this, these sort of methods were, you know, the, the, me the methods of the year. And then in 2019, we started seeing sort of the multimodal analysis. Uh, uh, in terms of single cell technology, so I think you know it's important to sort of divide these technologies into two into two uh, two halves. You know that you have the the discovery platforms that really do comprehensive analysis of the entire sample, telling you what each one of the cells in the sample uh, you know is 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 about, and then and then some more targeted uh, technologies that based that target a specific cell type. So this could historically this was done by uh, sort of doing sorting followed by uh, uh, followed by uh, uh, a downstream downstream analysis. So I think there are these two types of uh, 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 technologies in the in the comprehensive technology space. You know, the uh, I, I really think a lot of the, the the exciting innovations that I've seen recently have been on the computational side. So I've talked to talked to new uh, uh, new companies that have developed models of different different cell types. So for instance, they take a, a model that, uh, that is pre-trained for macrophages, and then they, then they uh, feed that, you know, they input into that model, a transcriptomic profile uh, of, a, of, a, of, a, of a macrophage, and they're able to then predict with good reliability, actually of what that cell, not only what that cell is now, the specific type of a macrophage, but also where it will, you know, where it where it will be in the future. So the the, the future sort of uh, uh, um, trajectory of the, of that particular cell type. Uh, in the, you know, I, I do think that that in the sort of in the targeted space, that's where that's where a lot of the, um, uh, uh, you know, I think a lot of lot of innovation is, is is still required. And I, you know, and I and and I, I mean, I I would be um, uh, I, I would I would be cutting cutting us short if I didn't. If I didn't say that I'm excited about our technology and what it can do for, you know, for the targeted uh, uh, single cell analysis. Yeah, Swami, what what about you? Um, I, I mean, I'm I'm coming again from the perspective of um, so what if you find something. So, and from that perspective, I like the idea of the perturb seek type of approaches, where you take a bunch of cells, throw across them a million different genetic perturbations um, through pooled CRISPR library, pooled CRISPR knockin type of experiments and observe how those perturbations affect the function and molecular response of the cells. So I think we're gonna see more and more of that. So start knocking down, um, right now people are trying to knock down different genes, but just randomly knock down non-coding regions, um, random sequences of the DNA. So to come get a complete picture of um, what the different sections of the, of the cell are doing, the different sections of the genome are doing. But in terms of the more technical technical tools, um, single cell proteomics is starting to come, come online now, which is kind of exciting. Um, We've already, I mean, we've always thought, Daniel mentioned since 2013 or so, um, that well, when you sequence a cell, you'll understand everything about a cell. Clearly, we don't. Um, proteins have a significant role. They're a lot closer to function than, than the genome or the transcriptome. So single cell proteomic techniques, I'm kind of keen to see what comes out of it. Um, but, but again, the general theme, again, is um, how do we relate the molecular states of cells to their functional manifestation? Uh, understanding the molecular states for a single cell or across a large library of cells, th these are inexpensive using sequencing technologies and imaging technologies and so on. But how those molecular states manifest as function, the more we understand, the more we can go to inexpensive tools uh, to try and make predictions on, on functional states of cells. So I mean, we are, for example, are building uh, technologies to directly manipulate or directly map for every single cell um, what the sequencing profile means in a functional context for an individual cell or for an individual cell in the context of other cells and different environments. So techniques like that, I think, are going to become more useful, more valuable as they come online. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I think I, I totally agree with all that. And, and I kind of want to touch on this idea of, you know, understanding these multi-omic um, combinations to get a more comprehensive and kind of whole picture insight into the functional state of the cell. And John, um, I want to start with you because I think you had mentioned this idea of like incorporating multimodal data into the field of diagnostics. Can you say a little bit more about that and kind of what are the mul what are the multiple modes that you've seen being incorporated into diagnostics? And, and maybe you can even touch on the, the different modes um, that Oraliva has, has been using. Uh, sure. So um, Oraliva's first uh, product or, or beachhead product is in the area of uh, oral cancer or oral lesion diagnosis. And in this particular area, we use a, a combination of, of different uh, data forms. Uh, we use cytology, we use uh, nuclear uh, image based parameters, we use protein expression, and also um, transcriptomic uh, uh, based uh, labels. Uh, we also are looking at risk factors, and each, each cancer has its own, own risk factors. Uh, but uh, in the large databases that we've been pulling together, we, we are basically agnostic about where does the data come from. Our goal is to create the best diagnostic model. And interestingly here, uh, we had some big surprises. Uh, and so uh, one of the big surprises here what was that uh, a, new C, a new cell phenotype, uh, which had nuclear actin rearranging and basically shrink wrapping around the nucleus, became the freedom tower of the New York City skylines. In other words, by far the best uh, discriminatory biomarker. Uh, and this was not uh, disclosed in the literature. We found it in, in uh, dysplastic patients, so the first time this is found in, in, in precancer. So uh, it, it, it creates kind of an interesting uh, technology uh, feedback loop where new technology creates new device, new device creates big database, big database with machine learning uh, options. Uh, gives us uh, more insight into uh, what's in, in, important, what's most important. And uh, for the, really for the first time, we're able to look at multiple hundreds of variables and, and do this across a non-biased data set. And I think that's, that's what's really key is with the 999 patients, we pulled in 13 million cells uh, about 2,000 cells per, per patient, uh, six diagnostic categories, and, and uh, we're, we're able to see the disease evolution. Um, so th this created another exciting uh, opportunity for a unique way that we use the data. And I would describe this as, as a uh, numerical index for cancer or a thermometer for early cancer detection. And we recently, uh, brought in a, a new $4 million NIH study with the, the NIDCR division of NIH with the goal of uh, putting forward a new standard of care to look for a time evolution of uh, patient's score. And in doing so, uh, find small changes of the individual. So this is precision diagnostics, uh, where we go above and beyond the limitation of a population and look for much more subtle changes relative to each individual becoming their own personal uh, re reference. And uh, our first lives saved in this area come from a Fanconi anemia study that we did uh, with a collaborator in Houston, but we actually found by looking at the numerical index, uh, a third of the patients that skyrocketed in the numerical index. Interestingly, the attending clinicians with this very, uh, very at-risk patient population did not see anything visibly. 
And um, so our score uh, caused them to go back and do a scalpel, uh, a scalpel biopsy. And at that point, they found cancer and they removed the cancer. And, and so we, we uh, added some years to the lives of these particular but to that question, so, John, when you when you are sorting through the immense amount of data that you collect and saying, here's some things that could be important, how do you decide between them? Yeah, so, so, so what we do is, is we use a conservative or a series of conservative machine learning methods. Uh, in this case, we use LASSO, uh, which is a logistic regression technique that uh, uh, basically selects patients into case versus control, but each subsequent variable is given a penalty. And uh, it's very easy to overfit the data. And that, that's one of the problems in this particular area that uh, academic papers uh, have 112 patient median average in a biomarker discovery, because that's typically what can be afforded. But but you need about a factor of 10 higher than that. Uh, you need non-biased um, non, uh, uh, patients that represent the final group. So, that, so having the right uh, clinical model, the right protocol is key, but then the AI and the machine learning needs to be done in a way that you don't overfit the data. And we found, and now have published this uh, technique of applying a penalty um, leads to a more sparse model. And we've tested this out in multiple areas. And so it, it's a glass box model. It's not a black box model. The, um, there are coefficients that show the relative importance of each of the variables. And that allows us to go back to this notion of the freedom power that, that we can say that this uh, F-actin, which is a mechanical protein it's normally not in the nucleus, but it rearranges when uh, precancer starts to show that that is a key signature, a, a, a major discovery in cancer biology that we will put into a variety of different cancers as we move forward. And so, Swami, in kind of contrast to John, your issue is that um, you're not using a glass box, you're using a glass slide, but in, in your case, there's not really a penalty to... to to doing the perturbation. So you end up with a sea of data and you're not sure what's important. These are, he's saying, well, you've got to sort through, you got a penalty with each one you add. In your case, you're just generating tons and tons of data. What, become, what becomes the important trade-off for you all? Yeah, the, uh, the, the, the idea there is conventional machine learning, conventional artificial intelligence is all about correlations, correlation between one data set and another data set. When you're able to do lots and lots of experiments, especially when you're able to perturb the system at really, really high throughput. Um, so you perturb the system one way, you get these types of molecular responses, these types of functional responses. If you perturb the system slightly different way, um, if the molecular responses and functional responses correlate or slightly diverge, you can convert those correlations to causation. So you can basically, because we measure both RNA and molecular responses and functional consequences of those molecular perturbations, um, by perturbing the system, it's a classic control complexity, control theory kind of argument. The more you can perturb the system, the more you can learn about it. So we go from correlations to causations um, or mechanis mechanisms of action. It's similar to what, what uh, John was saying, but rather than look at 1,000 different patients, we look at 1,000 different perturbations on a cell to figure out what are the causal perturbations um, that result in the functional. So we're not actually doing too many different things. Um, we are doing it in different model systems with actual patients. We are trying to simulate a patient population by perturbing it in a thousand, a million different ways and seeing what are truly corresponding or, or causal of a function. And then once you've seen that perturbation, you have to essentially design a specific test to say this one important thing has changed. Let's say you have identified something that causes or, or protects a cell from cell death. And so you wanna make an apoptosis assay very, very quickly and inexpensively and be able to uh, adapt your target to a new system. But you can't just, you, in order to create a diagnostic completely from scratch, you have to build a whole flywheel. So instead you go to sampling human, what are those trade-offs for you in terms, uh, Daniel, in terms of your technology when, when somebody brings a specific target, let's say after uh, to, to do a custom specific uh, apoptosis assay, 
what are the trade-offs that they're going to be faced with in working with you to try to develop a new diagnostic? So uh, uh, the the trade-offs, I guess, uh, maybe uh, can you, because so far we've been talking about uh, uh, machine learning sort of computational tools. So then uh, Justin, maybe uh, what kind so of- So we've, we've used that tool to identify that we want to go after this specific target. And so in your case, now that I've selected it, um, I can either develop my own test or I can use somebody else's test um, to, to, um, uh, to create that. So then I need to be able to come to you and say, I've got this target I think is really important. I think it might be relevant to your test. In in those in the other cases in Swami, they're dealing with huge amounts of data. And in your case, you've pushed all of the all that data aside. You've done that work. Right. You've identified that this is your asset. Yeah. How do you how do you then say this is the right format? This is the right. What are those trade offs that 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 you are dealing with in developing your assays? Because it's not let's look at all these different targets. It's I know which target I've got. Now I need to be able to build a very specific and selective test around. This. Yeah, so I mean, so we're we're obviously approaching this from the like like you correctly sort of identified. We're approaching this from the other side. So uh, you know, for for us, we're we we look at companies like Swami's, like uh, uh, you know, like Tenex Genomics and and other companies really as as sort of uh, uh, empowering the ecosystem of single cell biomarkers. Uh, and so then all of the you know the the the, the work that is done. In, in, in other companies to be able to identify those patterns. Uh, and I and we recognize that while machine learning is this really great tool, what's important is the level of expertise to back that tool. And it's gotta be domain specific. Uh, uh, and uh, and you know that, that great knowledge of what it, not only of sort of what, it, what a particular metric is required, but how that works within the whole context of you know that that particular workflow, that particular diagnostic, and so, you know, we 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 leverage all of that information, and then and then our whole our whole approach is to is to work with these field experts to then to then identify what that single cell biomarker is, and of course, you know, then uh, what then what we're able to do is we're able to design this very specific technology for that single cell biomarker that streamlines the workflow orders of magnitude. Uh, uh, and, you know, and, and that's really where we come in and that's sort of where, where our, you know, where our sweet spot is. Gotcha. Um, I want to get back to Ted really quick, but I do want to say to everyone attending, um, please, if you have any questions, please add them to the chat or the Q&A and we'll try to um, bring all those together. And here in about five minutes, we'll break for uh, Q&A and get some audience questions. And with that, I'll give it back to Ted. Perfect. Thanks, Justin. Yeah, I think, um, you know, maybe time for one more question. And, and, you know, we started broad, so I kind of want to end broad of just, um, we've, we, we've kind of touched on all these different, um, you know, newer technologies, newer trends, but I kind of want to know, like, you know, um, Dan, you had mentioned the, this type of like in silico modeling of single cell, but uh, more importantly, your company is kind of um, expounding on this non-expert workforce and, and Swami, you know, your technology is, is ultra high throughput and, and John, your technology is kind of changing diagnostics at the point of care. So, just you know, from three experts in the field, what are some trends that you predict um, will dominate the diagnostic space, or, or what kind of areas or trends um, is the space moving to that you think um, will be kind of predominant in the next ten years? And and Swami, I'd, I'd like to start with you. Yeah, I mean, I, I still think decentralization and democratization, like what we've been talking about, is going to become the more prominent trend with COVID. I mean, people realize they could do a test in their home. Um, so the, the the problem I see is, I mean, if you can narrow down or if you can kind of align on a modality that everybody could build a test around, um, that would make the decentralization process a lot more rapid, a lot more fast. Um, and my suspicion is it's probably going to be a sequencing or genomic space test or some combination of sequencing, imaging. Um, so kind of figuring out that combination of tests that can that can be universal and multiple different modalities. For, for sequencing, you can use a protein as a DNA readout. You can have a metabolite as a DNA readout. Uh, any kind of information as a DNA readout. Um, that's for the reason I think sequencing and sequencing-based tests um, and democratizing and decentralizing is the way uh, the, the future will, will, will go. Perfect, John. Well, I, I think moving forward, I, I agree with Swami about the um, democratization and movement uh, to more locations, but also uh, precision diagnostics, uh, I think, is an area that will begin to support precision medicine. 
and now we we see a great big value add for um, two percent of medical cost uh, influencing over sixty six percent of clinical decision making. So there's a lot of bang for the buck right now in clinical tests, but uh, I believe as we integrate AI more and more into clinical decision making that these become more smart diagnostics, which has a series of downstream kind of effects. Um, first, uh, we, we, we can expect uh, more intuitive interfaces with these diagnostic tests. And instead of a expert clinician uh, feeding into MD Calc, uh, a specialized uh, a series of diagnostic tests, which give them information about a clinical decision. We have a general practitioner, or we have GP dentist, or we have uh, nurses uh, taking a smart diagnostic that, that has, uh, has this information, actionable information provided back to them. So the new new diagnostic technologies, I think, in this area are going to pave a way for a new standard of care. Uh, and we're very excited about uh, some of this that we see already. Uh, there is some evidence that we're moving from illness to wellness. Uh, and that introduces a, a whole series of, uh, it's probably a, another uh, podcast just on that particular topic. But, but uh, these technologies will play a role here in the clinical lab, I think is going to change also. Uh, the clinical lab will be focusing more on specialized tests, and there'll be a rapid growth of point of care basically for everything else. These smart diagnostics uh, that impact care uh, the, on the technology side, the micro sampling, the higher sensitivity, uh, patient friendly sampling. Uh, less venous sticks, less CSF, uh, more automated cytology. I, I think the, the three companies that were featured here today are going to be in the middle of this uh, revolution. And part of this is, is to help uh, move away from objective medicine, uh, human beings looking at cells and making a judgment on a nuclear cytoplasm ratio of a few cells into data-driven decisions uh, that can be followed up uh, measurement to measurement to, to look for uh, slight changes from one, one uh, office visit to the next. And again, to allow us to focus and capture diseases early. Uh, outcomes are better, healthcare costs are, are reduced with that. A lot of people win with that particular objective. Yeah. And uh, Daniel, did you have anything to add? I mean, those were all, you know, those are a fairly exhaustive list. I think all great comments, you know, I think I would, I would maybe just maybe almost summarize really what was said. Uh, I think there's, you know, there's going to be a shift from a symptoms-based diagnostic to obviously more uh, preventive diagnostic, so more screening uh, that's that's going to be available. And we're sort of seeing that trend already with sort of some of these health span uh, type of movements, uh, health span, lifespan, aging, uh, aging trends that we're seeing. Uh, I think also we're going to see a shift from some of these more time-consuming diagnostics that are really sort of making the patients ache uh, uh, while they wait for wait to get an appointment to be analyzed by a uh, by a sophisticated instrument while they wait for the analysis uh, for the diagnosis and then while they wait and really get no results in the end because the data is not really specific enough. So I think there's going to be a shift to more non-invasive methods, a lot more information that will be uh, obtainable from liquid biopsies. Uh, and then lastly, I think, yeah, di diagnostic isn't just going to be used for, for medical purposes. I do think, uh, you know, it, it's good. It, uh, and we see some of this with glucose monitors, people just, just sort of seeing how, you know, how their, how their blood levels changes after they eat, uh, eat, eat a meal. So I think that there's going to be a much stronger collaboration between some of these diagnostic companies and uh, the and the sort of the, the health industry in the in the in the sort of supplement uh, uh, food food spaces as well. Well, if there are any major questions coming through on Q and A, we'd we'd welcome to have them. Um, but one of the things I'd like to ask is that um, as you are identifying 
um, your path forward in your technology and your your state in terms of the competition in this field, we are heading as a as a field writ large towards higher throughput, things in parallel, finer resolution, actual final convergence where yes, you can have as much data. I think John, just to use a, a note, I think it was something like four terabytes worth of data just coming from 999 patients. That seems like a lot, but in the you know five, 10 years, that's gonna be laughably small compared to the amount of data. Lasers don't need to go farther than you know one angstrom you know in terms of the ability to um, resolve the picture of a cell as we move towards that kind of limit of detection where do you end up on that on that um, thing where do you see the future of your technology when we are at the limit of detection where do you see yourselves in 10 years as a company yeah i mean i i can jump in um so i i think the critical element that is going to be needed to be solved uh, is decision support. So if you find that there's so many elements that are interrelated, so many multimodal data um, that could cause a functional outcome, what are the causal relationships? Um, I mean, if you have omics data, you have sequencing, proteomics, metabolomics, imaging, um, what are the components that are needed? Um, so, I mean, like, like both Dan, Daniel and John mentioned, uh, a, a primary care physician um, giving them a whole slew of data is not useful. So could you collapse them? Could you figure out what are the, the primary principal components of those multimodal data that result in a functional outcome? Um, so our interest is in being able to provide the decision support by actually doing those experiments. So perturbing the million different times, seeing how molecular responses, functional responses, images all correlate and what are the true principal components of those uh, perturbations and responses uh, and, and being able to provide that. Yeah, so I can jump in. Uh, sure. So, yeah, no, I think you know our our we, our, our um, perspective on that is, is is pretty clear. You know, we're targeted is always going to be more efficient than comprehensive. Uh, uh, and uh, and so with with us and it's and and a and a, and a and a and a solution that works in liquid in the reaction is always going to be more efficient than a serial solution that take that that takes the sample one at a time and so that's really where you know where we uh, uh see see our positioning there uh as far as you know how far uh in advance that goes so if you I mean if you look at the cost of single cell sequencing right now you're pretty much at a, a dollar dollar per cell in terms of costs uh so that means a milliliter of blood you're, you know, it's just, it's a easy calculation, $5 million uh, to do single cell sequencing on that, which would, you know, and those are sequencing costs really. So what we would, we, you know, a hundred dollar genome isn't going to be enough, uh, right? $1 genome really isn't going to be enough to make that, uh, to make that technology, uh, uh, you know, affordable for really practical use. So I think, you know, in, in, in terms of that, in terms of that perspective, uh, you know, that I, th I think uh, you know, that there's a, a pretty good, um, uh, a future sort of uh, ahead. And J Justin, if I could add my uh, last two cents on, on this. So, so 10 years from now, I think where we want to be is, is changing the dynamic of, of how cancer is diagnosed. And, and today, only 14% of cancers are diagnosed with a screening test. We have four screening tests today. 86% of them are not. Uh, the majority of these are late stage cancers. And, and cancer is a, a cellular d disease uh, dysregulation. And uh, cells we feel will have a very important role in moving past the image-based approaches, uh, which today dominate the cancer, uh, cancer diagnostic space. Uh, we can't rely simply at the last stage of having a, a, a tissue. Um, so fine needle aspiration and wide bore asp aspiration and uh, brush biopsies, a, a variety of, of less invasive strategies we feel will be the new currency, and our goal will be to go from 14% to 86% to, to have many, many more 
cancers diagnosed at the cellular level and have a suite of diagnostics that come in come into play. Uh, so that's part of the issue, and, and I believe we get there by uh, collecting new data. Uh, so we've talked a lot about AI and machine learning. Uh, the penultimate way to do this is deep learning and have an evergreen process of uh, a continual ripening uh, of the understanding of cancer diagnostics. And again, moving from late stage to earlier stage into the monitoring of benign conditions. And um, out of that, uh, we will also empower non-experts to become expert, non-expert uh, providers to become expert providers. This is all about uh, uh, using our healthcare dollars better, uh, but also about extending to all aspects and all portions of the United States to democratize uh, the most sophisticated cytology things on the planet, we believe will be done with these kind of new technologies uh, backed by rigorous clinical studies to, to find the signatures that are uh, well characterized. Um, and in doing so, uh, the next step or the final step here, I think, is to to change the standard of care. And uh, we see a little bit of evidence now we're in what we're doing right now. Uh, we, we bumped into the fact that mild dysplasia uh, in our oral, oral cancer release has no standard of care. Um, there's just no agreement what to do with that particular early stage of, of cancer. So, so we have a way to diagnose it and we believe the next step is one in which that will uh, receive regulatory bodies and, and the support of, of a new process. Well, well John, thank you for uh, sharing uh, about We're Alive Out today. Um, uh, Daniel, thank you so much for uh, sharing about Sampling Human. Salmi, thank you so much for sharing about Zafrin's and for attending, uh, even though you're not perfectly within uh, uh, diagnostics, getting three different views of the cell for different purposes um, and, and different layers of information. And thank you so much for tying all of this together, for hosting this webinar, for bringing all of us here uh, and for, for being great support um, uh, this year so far. Um, you did an excellent job. Uh, all the attendees in the audience, thank you all for being here. Um, uh, this is excellent. And we'll see you on the next PML webinar. Thanks everyone. Thank you, thank you Justin. Thanks, Ted. Nice to meet you.